The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare Act Two Scene One Belmont A Room in Portia's House Flourish of Cornets Enter the Prince of Morocco and his followers Portia Nerissa and others of her train mislike me not for my complexion the shadowed livery of the burnished sun to whom i am a neighbour and near bred bring me the fairest creature northward born where phoebus's fire scarce thaws the icicles and let us make incision for your love to prove whose blood is reddest his or mine i tell thee lady this aspect of mine hath feared the valiant by my love, I swear, the best-regarded virgins of our clime have loved it too. I would not change this hue, except to steal your thoughts, my gentle queen. In terms of choice, I am not solely led by nice direction of a maiden's eyes. Besides, the lottery of my destiny bars me the right of voluntary choosing. But if my father had not scanted me, and hedged me by his wit, to yield myself his wife who wins me by that means I told you, yourself, renowned prince, then stood as fair as any comer I have looked on yet for my affection. Even for that I thank you. Therefore I pray you, lead me to the caskets to try my fortune. By this scimitar, that slew the Sophi and a Persian prince, that won three fields of Sultan Solomon, I would o'erstare the sternest eyes that look outbrave the heart most daring on the earth pluck the young sucking cubs from the she-bear yea mock the lion when he roars for prey to win thee lady but alas the while if hercules and lycus play at dice which is the better man the greater throw may turn by fortune from the weaker hand so is alcides beaten by his page and so may i blind fortune leading me miss that which one unworthier may attain and die with grieving you must take your chance and either not attempt to choose at all or swear before you choose if you choose wrong never to speak to lady afterward in way of marriage therefore be advised nor will not come bring me unto my chance first forward to the temple after dinner your hazard shall be made good fortune then to make me blessed or cursed among men. Cornets and Exeunt Scene 2 Venice A Street Enter Lancelot Gobo Certainly my conscience will serve me to run from this Jew my master. The fiend is at mine elbow and tempts me, saying to me, Gobo, Lancelot Gobo, good Lancelot, or good Gobo, or good Lancelot Gobo, use your legs, take the start, run away. My conscience says, no, take heed, honest Lancelot, take heed, honest Gobo. Or, as aforesaid, honest Lancelot Gobo, do not run, scorn running with thy heels. Well, the most courageous fiend bids me pack. Via, says the fiend, away, says the fiend. For the heavens rouse up a brave mind, says the fiend, and run. Well, my conscience, hanging about the neck of my heart, says very wisely to me, My honest friend Launcelot, being an honest man's son, or rather, an honest woman's son, for indeed my father did something smack, something grow to, he had a kind of taste. Well, my conscience says, Launcelot, budge not. Budge, says the fiend. Budge not, says my conscience. Conscience, say I, you counsel well. Fiend, says I, you counsel well. To be ruled by my conscience, I should stay with the Jew, my master, who, God bless the mark, is a kind of devil. And, to run away from the Jew, I should be ruled by the fiend, who, saving your reverence, is the devil himself. Certainly the Jew is the very devil incarnal. And, in my conscience, my conscience is but a kind of hard conscience, to offer to counsel me to stay with the Jew. The fiend gives the more friendly counsel. I will run, fiend. My heels are at your commandment. I will run. Enter Old Gobo with a basket. 
Master young man, you, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? Aside. Oh, heavens, this is my true begotten father who, being more than sand blind, high gravel blind, knows me not. I will try confusions with him. Master young gentleman, I pray you, which is the way to master Jews? Turn up on your right hand at the next turning, but at the next turning of all on your left, Mary, at the very next turning, turn of no hand, but turn down indirectly to the Jew's house. By God, Santis, twill be a hard way to hit. Can you tell me whether one Launcelot that dwells with him, dwell with him or no? Talk you of young Master Launcelot? Aside. Mark me now. Now will I raise the waters. Talk you of young Master Launcelot? No master, sir, but a poor man's son, his father, though I say it, is an honest, exceeding poor man, and, God be thanked, well to live. Well, let his father be what a will. We talk of a young Master Launcelot. Your worship's friend and Launcelot, sir. But I pray you, ergo, old man, ergo, I beseech you, talk you of young Master Launcelot? Of Launcelot, ain't please your mastership. Ergo, Master Launcelot, talk not of Master Launcelot, father, for the young gentleman, according to fates and destinies and such odd sayings the sisters three and such branches of learning is indeed deceased or as you would say in plain terms gone to heaven mary god forbid the boy was the very staff of my age my very prop do i look like a cudgel or a hovel post or a staff or a prop do you know me father alack the day i know you not young gentleman but i pray you tell me is my boy God rest his soul, alive or dead. Do you not know me, father? Alack, sir, I am sandblind. I know you not. Nay, indeed, if you had your eyes, you might fail of the knowing me. It is a wise father that knows his own child. Well, old man, I will tell you news of your son. Give me your blessing. Truth will come to light. Murder cannot be hid long. A man's son may, but in the end, truth will out. Pray you, sir, stand up. I am sure you are not Launcelot, my boy. Pray you, let's have no more fooling about it. Give me your blessing. I am Launcelot, your boy that was, your son that is, your child that shall be. I cannot think you are my son. I know not what I shall think of that, but I am Launcelot, the Jew's man, and I am sure Marjorie, your wife, is my mother. Her name is Marjorie, indeed. I'll be sworn, if thou be Launcelot, thou art my own flesh and blood. Lord, worship might he be. What a beard hast thou got? Thou hast got more hair on thy chin than Dobbin my throw-horse has on his tail. It should seem, then, that Dobbin's tail grows backward. I am sure he had more hair on his tail than I have on my face when I last saw him. Lord, how art thou changed? How dost thou and thy master agree? I have brought him a present. How greed you now? Well, well, but for mine own part, as I have set up my rest to run away, so I will not rest till I have run some ground. My master's a very Jew. Give him a present. Give him a halter. I am famished in his service. You may tell every finger I have with my ribs. Father, I am glad you are come. Give me your present to one Master Bassanio, who indeed gives rare new liveries. If I serve him not, I will run as far as God has any ground. O oh, rare fortune! Here comes the man. To him, father, for I am a Jew, if I serve the Jew any longer. Enter Bassanio with Leonardo, with other followers. You may do so, but let it be so hasted that supper be ready at the farthest by five of the clock. See these letters delivered, put the liveries to making, and desire Graciano to come anon to my lodging. Exit a servant. To him, father. God bless your worship. Grimercy, wouldst thou aught with me? Here is my son, sir, a poor boy. Not a poor boy, sir, but the rich Jew's man. That would, sir, as my father shall specify. He hath a great infection, sir, as one would say, to serve. Indeed, the short and the long is, I serve the Jew, and have a desire, as my father shall specify. His master and he, saving your worship's reverence, are scarce cater cousins. To be brief, the very truth is that the Jew, having done me wrong, doth cause me, 
as my father, being, I hope, an old man, shall fructify unto you. I have here a dish of doves that I would bestow upon your worship, and my suit is— In very brief, the suit is impertinent to myself, as your worship shall know by this honest old man. And, though I say it, though old man, yet poor man, my father— one speak for you both what would you serve you sir that is the very defect of the matter sir i know thee well thou hast obtained thy suit shylock thy master spoke with me this day and hath preferred thee if it be preferment to leave a rich jew's service to become the follower of so poor a gentleman the old proverb is very well parted between my master shylock and you sir you have the grace of God, sir, and he hath enough. Thou speak'st it well. Go, father, with thy son. Take leave of thy old master, and inquire my lodging out. To a servant. Give him a livery more guarded than his fellows. See it done. Father, in. I cannot get a service, no. I have ne'er a tongue in my head. Looking on his palm. Well, if any man in Italy have a fairer table which doth offer to swear upon a book, I shall have good fortune. Go to. Here's a simple line of life. Here's a small trifle of wives. Alas, fifteen wives is nothing. Eleven widows and nine maids is a simple coming in for one man. And then to scrape drowning thrice, and to be in peril of my life with the edge of a feather bed. Here are simple scapes. Well, if fortune be a woman, she's a good wench for this gear. Father, come. I'll take my leave of the Jew in the twinkling of an eye. Exeunt Launcelot and old Gobo. I pray thee, good Leonardo, think on this. These things being bought and orderly bestowed, return in haste. For I do feast to-night my best esteemed acquaintance. Hi thee, go! My best endeavor shall be done herein. Enter Gratiano. Where's your master? Yonder, sir, he walks. Exit. Signor Bassanio? Graciano. I have suit to you. You have obtained it. You must not deny me. I must go with you to Belmont. Why, then you must. But hear thee, Graciano, thou art too wild, too rude, and bold of voice. Parts that become thee happily enough, and in such eyes as ours appear not false. But where thou art not known, why, there they show something too liberal. Pray thee, take pain to allay with some cold drops of modesty thy skipping spirit, lest through thy wild behavior I be misconstrued in the place I go to, and lose my hopes. Signor Bassanio, hear me. If I do not put on a sober habit, talk with respect, and swear but now and then, wear prayer books in my pocket, look demurely, nay more, while grace is saying, hood mine eyes thus with my hat, and sigh and say, Amen, use all the observance of civility, like one well studied in a sad ostent to please his grandam, never trust me more. Well, we shall see your bearing. Nay, but I bar to-night. You shall not gauge me by what we do to-night. No, that were pity. I would entreat you rather to put on your boldest suit of mirth, for we have friends that purpose merriment. But fare you well, I have some business. And I must to Lorenzo and the rest, but we will visit you at supper-time. Exeunt. Scene three. The same. A room in Shylock's house. Enter Jessica and Launcelot. I am sorry thou wilt leave my father so. Our house is hell, and thou, a merry devil, didst rob it of some taste of tediousness. But fare thee well. There is a ducat for thee. And Launcelot, soon at supper shalt thou see Lorenzo, who is thy new master's guest. Give him this letter. Do it secretly. And so farewell, I would not have my father see me and talk with thee. Adieu, tears exhibit my tongue, most beautiful pagan, most sweet Jew. If a Christian do not play the knave and get thee, I am much deceived. But adieu, these foolish drops do something drown my manly spirit. Adieu. Farewell, good Launcelot. Exit Launcelot. Alack. What heinous sin is it in me to be ashamed to be my father's child? 
But though I am a daughter to his blood, I am not to his manners. O oh, Lorenzo, if thou keep promise, I shall end this strife. Become a Christian, and thy loving wife. Exit. Scene four. The same. A street. Enter Gratiano, Lorenzo, Salarino, and Salanio. Nay, we will slink away in supper-time, disguise us at my lodging, and return all in an hour. We have not made good preparation. We have not spoke as yet of torch-bearers. Tis vile, unless it may be quaintly ordered, and better in my mind not undertook. Tis now but four o'clock, we have two hours to furnish us. Enter Launcelot with a letter. Friend Lancelot, what is the news? And it shall please you to break up this. It shall seem to signify. I know the hand in faith. Tis a fair hand, and whether that a paper it writ on, is the fair hand that writ? Love news in faith. By your leave, sir. Whither goest thou? Mary, sir, to bid my old master, the Jew, to sup tonight with my new master, the Christian. Hold, here, take this. Tell gentle Jessica, I will not fail her, speak it privately. Go, gentlemen. Exit Launcelot. Will you prepare you for this mask tonight? I am provided of a torch-bearer. Ay, Mary, I'll be gone about it straight. And so will I. Meet me and Graciano at Graciano's lodging some hour hence. Tis good we do so. Exeunt, Salarino and Salanio. Was not that letter from fair Jessica? I must needs tell thee all. She hath directed how I shall take her from her father's house, what gold and jewels she is furnished with, what pages suit she hath in readiness, if e'er a Jew, her father, come to heaven, it will be for his gentle daughter's sake. And never dare misfortune cross her foot, unless she do it under this excuse, that she is issued to a faithless Jew. Come, go with me, pursue this as thou goest, Fair Jessica shall be my torch-bearer. Exeunt. Scene five. The same. Before Shylock's house. Enter Shylock and Launcelot. Well, thou shalt see, thy eye shall be thy judge, the difference of old Shylock and Bassanio. But, Jessica, thou shalt not gormandize as thou hast done with me. What, Jessica? And sleep and snore and rend the peril out? Why, Jessica, I say! Why, Jessica? Who bids thee call? I do not bid thee call. Your worship was wont to tell me I could do nothing without bidding. Enter Jessica. Call you? What is your will? I am bid forth to supper, Jessica. There are my keys. But wherefore should I go? I am not bid for love. They flatter me, but yet I'll go in hate to feed upon the prodigal Christian. Jessica, my girl, look to my house. I am right loath to go. There is some ill a-brewing towards my rest, for I did dream of money-bags to-night. I beseech you, sir, go. My young master doth expect your reproach. So do I his. And they have conspired together. I will not say you shall see a mask, but if you do, then it was not for nothing that my nose fell a-bleeding on Black Monday, last at six o'clock in the morning. Falling out that year on Ash Wednesday was four year in the afternoon. What? Are there masks? Hear you me, Jessica. Lock up my doors, and when you hear the drum and the vile squealing of the wry-necked fife, clamber not you up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street to gaze on Christian fools with varnished faces. But stop my house's ears, I mean my casements. Let not the sound of shallow foppery enter my sober house. By Jacob's staff, I swear I have no mind of feasting forth tonight. But I will go. Go you before me, sirrah. Say I will come. I will go before, sir. Mistress, look out the window for all this. There will come a Christian by, will be worth a Jewess's eye. Exit, Launcelot. What says that fool of Hagar's offspring, huh? His words were farewell, mistress, nothing else. The patch is kind enough. 
but a huge feeder, snail slow in profit, and he sleeps by day more than the wild cat. Drones hive not with me, therefore I part with him, and part with him to one that I would have him help to waste his borrowed purse. Well, Jessica, go in. Perhaps I will return immediately. Do as I bid you, shut doors after you, fast bind, fast find, a proverb never stale in thrifty mind. Exit. Farewell. And if my fortune be not crossed, I have a father, you a daughter, lost. Exit. Scene six. The same. Enter Gratiano and Salarino. Mast. This is the penthouse under which Lorenzo desired us to make stand. His hour is almost past. And it is marvel he outdwells his hour, for lovers ever run before the clock. Oh, ten times faster Venus pigeons fly to seal love's bonds new made than they are wont to keep obliged faith unforfeited. That ever holds. Who riseth from a feast with that keen appetite that he sits down? Where is the horse that doth untread again his tedious measures with the unbated fire that he did pace them first? All things that are are with more spirit chased than enjoyed. How like a younger or a prodigal the scarfed bark puts from her native bay, hugged and embraced by the strumpet wind! How like the prodigal doth she return, with overweathered ribs and ragged sails, lean, rent, and beggared by the strumpet wind? Here comes Lorenzo. More of this hereafter. Enter Lorenzo. Sweet friends, you're patient for my long abode. Not I, but my affairs have made you wait. When you shall please to play the thieves for wives, I'll watch as long for you then. Approach, here dwells my father Jew. Ho, who's within? Enter Jessica, above, in boy's clothes. Who are you? Tell me for more certainty, albeit I'll swear that I do know your tongue. Lorenzo and thy love. Lorenzo, certain, and my love indeed. For who love I so much? And now who knows but you, Lorenzo, whether I am yours? Heaven and thy thoughts are witness that thou art. Here, catch this casket, it is worth the pains. I am glad tis night, you do not look on me, for I am much ashamed of my exchange. But love is blind, and lovers cannot see the pretty follies that themselves commit. For if they could, Cupid himself would blush to see me thus transformed to a boy. Descend, for you must be my torch-bearer. What, must I hold a candle to my shames? They in themselves, good sooth, are too, too light. Why, tis an office of discovery, love, and I should be obscured. So are you, sweet, even in the lovely garnish of a boy. But come at once, for the close night doth play the runaway, and we are stayed for at Bassanio's feast. I will make fast the doors, and gild myself with some o ducats, and be with you straight. Exit above. Now, by my hood, a Gentile and no Jew. Beshrew me, but I love her heartily, for she is wise if I can judge of her, and fair she is if that mine eyes be true, and true she is as she hath proved herself, and therefore like herself wise, fair, and true. Shall she be placed in my constant soul? Enter Jessica. What, art thou come? On, gentlemen, away! Our masking mates by this time for a stay. Exit with Jessica and Salarino. Enter Antonio. Who's there? Signor Antonio. Fie, fie, Gratiano. Where are all the rest? Tis nine o'clock, our friends all stay for you. No mask tonight, the wind is come about. Bassanio presently will go aboard. I have sent twenty out to seek for you. I am glad, aunt. I desire no more delight than to be under sail and gone tonight. Exeunt. Scene 7. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Flourish of cornets. Enter Portia with the Prince of Morocco and their train. Go draw aside the curtains, and discover the several caskets to this noble prince. Now make your choice. The first, of gold, 
who this inscription bears, Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. The second silver, which this promise carries, Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. This third dull lead, with warning all is blunt, Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. How shall I know if I do choose the right? The one of them contains my picture, Prince. If you choose that, then I am yours withal. Some god direct my judgment. Let me see. I will survey the inscriptions back again. What says this leaden casket? Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Must give. For what? For lead? Hazard for lead. This casket threatens. Men that hazard all do it in hope of fair advantages. A golden mine stoops not to shows of dross. I'll then nor give nor hazard aught for lead. What says the silver with her virgin hue? Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. As much as he deserves. Pause there, Morocco, and weigh thy value with an even hand. If thou beest rated by thy estimation, thou dost deserve enough, and yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. And yet to be afeard of my deserving were but a weak disabling of myself. As much as I deserve, why, that's the lady. I do in birth deserve her, and in fortunes, in graces, and in qualities of breeding. But more than these, in love I do deserve. What if I strayed no farther, but chose here? Let's see once more this saying graved in gold. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. Why, that's the lady. All the world desires her. From the four corners of the earth they come to kiss this shrine, this mortal breathing saint. The Hyrcanian deserts and the vasty wilds of wide Arabia are as thoroughfares now for princes to come view fair Portia. The watery kingdom, whose ambitious head spits in the face of heaven, is no bar to stop the foreign spirits but they come as o'er a brook to see fair Portia. One of these three contains her heavenly picture. Is it like that lead contains her? T'were damnation to think so base a thought. It were too gross to rib her cerecloth in the obscure grave. Or shall I think in silver she's immured, being ten times undervalued to tried gold? Oh, sinful thought! Never so rich a gem was set in worse than gold. They have in England a coin that bears the figure of an angel, stamped in gold, but that's in sculpt upon. But here an angel in a golden bed lies all within. Deliver me the key, here do I choose, and thrive I as I may. There, take it, Prince, and if my form lie there, then I am yours. He unlocks the golden casket. Oh, hell! What have we here? A carrion death! within whose empty eye there is a written scroll. I'll read the writing. All that glisters is not gold. Often have you heard that told. Many a man his life hath sold, but my outside to behold. Gilded tombs do worms enfold. Had you been as wise as bold, young in limbs, in judgment old, your answer had not been enscrolled. Fare you well. Your suit is cold. Cold, indeed, had labor lost. Then, farewell, heat, and welcome, frost. Portia, adieu, I have too grieved a heart to take a tedious leave. Thus loser's part. Exit with his train. Flourish of cornets. A gentle riddance. Draw the curtains. Go. Let all of his complexion choose me so. Exeunt. Scene 8. Venice. A street. Enter Salarino and Salagno. Why, man, I saw Bassanio under sail. With him is Gratiano gone along. And in their ship I am sure Lorenzo is not. The villain Jew with outcries raised the duke, who went with him to search Bassanio's ship. He came too late. The ship was under sail. But there the duke was given to understand that in a gondola were seen together Lorenzo and his amorous Jessica. Besides, Antonio certified the duke they were not with Bassanio in his ship, 
I never heard a passion so confused, so strange, outrageous, and so variable as the dog Jew did utter in the streets. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh my Christian ducats, justice, the law, my ducats, and my daughter, a sealed bag, two sealed bags of ducats, of double ducats stolen from me by my daughter, and jewels, two stones, two rich and precious stones stolen by my daughter, justice, find the girl, she hath the stones upon her and the ducats. Why, all the boys in Venice follow him, crying, his stones, his daughter, and his ducats. Let good Antonio look he keep his day, or he shall pay for this. Mary, well remembered. I reasoned with a Frenchman yesterday, who told me, in the narrow seas that part the French and English, there miscarried a vessel of our country richly fraught. I thought upon Antonio when he told me, and wished in silence that it were not his. You were best to tell Antonio what you hear, yet do not suddenly, for it may grieve him. A kinder gentleman treads not the earth. I saw Bassanio and Antonio part. Bassanio told him he would make some speed of his return. He answered, Do not so. Slubber not business for my sake, Bassanio, but stay the very riping of the time, and for the Jew's bond which he hath of me, let it not enter in your mind of love. Be merry, and employ your chiefest thoughts to courtship, and such fair ostents of love as shall conveniently become you there. And even there, his eye being big with tears, Turning his face, he put his hand behind him, and with affection wondrous sensible, he wrung Bassanio's hand, and so they parted. I think he only loves the world for him. I pray thee, let us go and find him out, and quicken his embraced heaviness with some delight or other. Do we so? Exeunt. Scene 9. Belmont. A room in Portia's house. Enter Nerissa with a servitor. Quick, quick, I pray thee, draw the curtain straight. The Prince of Aragon hath ta'en his oath, and comes to his election presently. Flourish of cornets. Enter the Prince of Aragon, Portia, and their trains. Behold, there stand the caskets, noble prince. If you choose that wherein I am contained, straight shall our nuptial rites be solemnized. But if you fail, without more speech, my lord, you must be gone from hence immediately. I am enjoined by oath to observe three things. First, never to unfold to any one which casket t'was I chose. Next, if I fail of the right casket, never in my life to woo a maid in way of marriage. Lastly, if I do fail in fortune of my choice, immediately to leave you and be gone. To these injunctions every one doth swear that comes to hazard for my worthless self. And so have I addressed me. Fortune now to my heart's hope. Gold, silver, and base lead. Who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. <laughs> you shall look fairer ere I give or hazard. What says the golden chest? Ha, let me see. Who chooseth me shall gain what many men desire. What many men desire? That many may be meant by the fool multitude that choose by show, not learning more than the fond eye doth teach, which pries not to the interior, but like the martlet builds in the weather on the outward wall, even in the force and road of casualty. I will not choose what many men desire, because I will not jump with common spirits and rank me with the barbarous multitudes. Why then, to thee, thou silver treasure house, tell me once more what title thou dost bear. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And well said too. For who shall go about to cousin Fortune and be honourable without the stamp of merit? Let none presume to wear an undeserved dignity. Oh, that his states, degrees, and offices were not derived corruptly, and that clear honour were purchased by the merit of the wearer! How many then should cover that stand bare? How many be commanded that command? How much low peasantry would then be gleaned from the true seed of honour? 
and how much honour picked from the chaff and ruin of the times to be new varnished. Well, but to my choice. Who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. Give me a key for this, and instantly unlock my fortunes here. He opens the silver casket. Too long a pause for that which you find there. What's here? The portrait of a blinking idiot presenting me a schedule? I will read it. How much unlike art thou to Portia? How much unlike my hopes and my deservings? Who chooseth me shall have as much as he deserves. Did I deserve no more than a fool's head? Is that my prize? Are my deserts no better? To offend and judge are distinct offices, and of opposed natures. What is here? The fire seven times tried this. Seven times tried that judgment is that did never choose amiss. Some there be that shadows kiss, such have but a shadow's bliss. There be fools alive, I wis, silvered o'er, and so was this. Take what wife you will to bed, I will ever be your head, so be gone you are sped. Still more fool I shall appear by the time I linger here. With one fool's head I came to woo, but I go away with two. Sweet adieu, I'll keep my oath patiently to bear my wrath. Exit Aragon with his train. Thus hath the candle singed the moth. Oh, these deliberate fools! When they do choose, they have the wisdom by their wit to lose. The ancient saying is no heresy. Hanging and wiving goes by destiny. Come, draw the curtain, Nerissa. Enter a servant. Where is my lady? Here, what would my lord? Madam, there is alighted at your gate a young Venetian, one that comes before to signify the approaching of his lord, from whom he bringeth sensible regrets, to wit, besides commends and courteous breath, gifts of rich value. Yet I have not seen so likely an ambassador of love. A day in April never came so sweet, to show how costly summer was at hand, as this forespurrer comes before his lord. No more, I pray thee. I am half afeard thou wilt say anon he is some kin to thee, thou spent such high day wit in praising him. Come, come, Nerissa, for I long to see quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. Bassanio, Lord Love, if thy will it be. Exeunt. End of Act Two.